Hello friends, Mandar here. I'm back with another video. In today's video, we'll talk about upgrade from EB2, EB3 to EB1C in particular. We'll also talk about some of the important questions on EAD and AP and several different situations and in particular in relation to the job change. So there are a lot of important topics in this video. Watch this video until the end and let's get started. If you are here for the first time, welcome. My name is Mandar and I make immigration and lifestyle related videos for US and Canada. I'm not an immigration lawyer, so anything that I say on this video or on my channel is for information purpose only. And for your specific immigration needs before you take any action, you should hire a competent immigration lawyer. Now before we jump into the topic, check out the links in the description. And while you are down there, hit the like button because that will greatly help the challenge. Now our first topic. Lot of people are stuck in the backlog for EB2 and EB3, India in particular. Now is there an option to upgrade to EB1C? Now if you are current in the last year, your date must have been somewhere around 20, 20, 2013 or 2014 and which retrogressed back to 2012 now. And in, or in other situation, you may be in 2016, 2017 time frame. Now it's a long wait for you to be honest, things are not looking up things are not moving forward you can see in the visa bulletins and check out my visa bulletin prediction video if you haven't already uh, which i made a couple of weeks back there is not going to be much of a progression in the next one or two years at the least now if you are in a situation where you are stuck in your eb2 or eb3 in uh, with the priority date 2013 or 2014 you may have your green card ead and your advanced parole in that situation you may be thinking of several different ways how you can upgrade your petition to get out of this rut right one option is if you have money and if you can afford to go through eb5 route now again eb5 is also retrogress but it is not as bad as eb2 and eb3 so you may still get your green card sooner if you try the eb5 route now it is a little bit risky route because you are investing your money into a project and that project has to be viable and it has to be successful in order for them to return your money back there are cases where the projects go south and you don't recover your money and money aspect is the risk that you take. You may still get your green card through EB3, EB5 process, but there is a risk in getting back your investment. But if you do your due diligence on the projects that you are investing in, that might be a route for you to get out of this EB2 and EB3 situation. Another thing is, if you are working for a consultant company or a multinational company that has a presence of or main, main head office outside of the United States, but also has a subsidiary in the United States, then you may want to think about EB1C route. Now EB1C is for multinational managers or executives. So say for instance, your company has its headquarters in India or anywhere outside of the United States. And you have been working in that company for a long time and at least in a managerial capacity for one year in the last three years. You have a big team, you have a big portfolio of products or portfolio of softwares that your team is building and you have a significant contribution to that company and if the company decides to send you to the united states to establish or grow your team in the united states your company already has a subsidiary in the united states that has been in the business for at least a year if you fulfill all these conditions you may be able to apply for eb1c now we are talking about the situation where you are already in the United States on EB2 or EB3 and you want to pursue this route. In this case, talk to your company, look at your company's business and its presence outside of the United States. If it has a head office outside of the United States and if your management or if your company is willing to sponsor you to go outside, stay outside of the United States for at least a year in a managerial or a executive role, you can pursue this path. Now, there are a couple of risks in that. I know a lot of examples where people were able to work with their management or their company to stay outside, the, uh, outside of the United States, but they never got a chance to come back to the United States for whatever reason. The company's business model changed, their visas were getting rejected and things like that. So there is a risk to this approach, even if your company supports you to work outside the US and come back and apply in EB1C, this is a little bit of a risky route. Because there are several factors in it. 
there is one your company's commitment if they live up to that commitment the second one is if the business changes if your role changes if you get laid off during in the meantime then the whole dynamic changes so assess your situation with your company with your manager and see if this eb1c route is feasible for you is it a, is it feasible for you to stay outside of the united states for one full year along with your family but because there may be several different situations in one situation your family might be young your kids might be younger or you may not have any kids in that situation it's easy to go out of the us live in canada or in india for a year or year and a half and then come back it's much easier in another situation if your kids are older then it becomes a little bit of a tricky situation because now they cannot leave their schools so they have to stay here on and you have to be outside of the united states in that situation what is their status going to be in the us that is something to think about because if they are on your h1 uh, dependent on your h1b then and if you are not in the us for uh, over a year then they cannot stay in the us because they are dependents and they are dependents on your h1b and if you are not in the country uh, then they don't have any valid status they have to move on to some other status like student visa or visitor visa or something like that so that is something to consider so although technically yes it is possible for you to go from eb2 to eb1c logistically it might present you different kinds of challenges based on your situation so think about it but yes if all the stars line up and if everything goes well for you then it is a very good route to consider remember eb1 is also retrogress but it has a chance of becoming current in october of 2023 another point i wanted to mention is instead of eb1c you may also want to consider eb1a because you have lived in the us for, for such a long time you may have the credentials you may have those references and those publications and those those patents in order for you to qualify for eb1 e so that might also be an option for you now another related question to this eb2 to eb1c do you have to be on l1a in order to qualify for eb1c the straight answer is no you don't have to be on l1a you can be on h1b and still qualify for eb1c if you fulfill all the conditions of eb1c l1a just makes it a little bit easier because l1 base uh, l1a's conditions are similar or requirements are similar to that one of eb1c so they kind of go hand in hand but it is not a requirement to be on l1a to be qualify or uh, to qualify for eb1c now let's shift our conversation to ead and advance payroll now ead as you know it is not a visa and if you didn't know this know this that it is not a visa ead in itself is just an work authorization like it says so that's the first point i wanted to clarify because people say can i switch over from h1b to ead in that situation you are talking about the work authorization yes you can switch from h1b to ead if it if that's what you want to do but ead in itself does not prove you a status now if you are in 485 stage there are several different scenarios where you can get an ead even the opt that you get while you are studying on f1 stu uh, student visa is also an ead card employment authorization document so what are we talking about here so i specifically wanted to talk about green card ead if you are on h1b and if you have applied gone through your green card process and you are in 485 stage your uh, dates may have retrogressed again in the previous like in the previous situation now in this case you still have an ead the first question is can you switch over from h1b to ead is there any risk in it the answer is yes you can switch over from h1b to ead the only risk is you don't have an underlying safety net in case your green card gets rejected but my argument is if your green card gets rejected for some uh, some purpose you have a bigger problem to deal with because it's just not matter of having a safety net of h1b if your green card gets rejected it, it, that means you have some significant issue with your immigration status that could come back to haunt you even for your h1b extensions in future so just by saying that if i continue to stay on h1b i am in i have a safety net regardless of what happens to your green card process that's not entirely true so that is my argument the second point is yes there are benefits of staying on h1b because that is kind of a safety net but that is a moot point if your green card gets rejected the other point is if you use your ead that means your h1b doesn't stay active some people ask me can i work and also do my business while maintaining my h1b 
because I have a green card EAD. My answer and uh, this is just my opinion and you'll hear different opinions with lawyers and all. My personal opinion is if you are on H1B, that's your status. You cannot use EAD to do the business. If you want to do business and a job, just switch over to EAD. If you are on EAD, you, it will allow you to do your job and your business and do multiple jobs if you wish. That's all possible on EAD. So that is the important clarification that I wanted to make. Now another clarification I wanted to make about the advanced parole is if you are on H1B and you are in the green card process, you have 485 uh, EAD and advanced parole. If you travel outside and come back on an advanced parole, your status in the United States does not remain H1B. By the virtue of coming back on advanced parole, you have switched over from H1B to parolee status. The reason I say this is if you came back on advanced parole, go online and check your I-94 status. Your status will not say H1B, your status will say DA entry. That means that you no longer are on H1B. Some people just casually think that they can go out and come back on uh, advanced parole and still think that they are on H1B. Technically, they are not. Now, 99.9% .9 of the people may not think about it because they will soon get their green cards and this will be a non-issue. But if you are on extended wait time and if you think that you are continuing to do your H1, continuing to be on H1B, that is not the case. In order to reinstate your H1B, you will have to do an extension, amendment or something similar to reactivate your H1B. So that is something that I wanted to just clarify. And then the last point I wanted to talk about uh, about the EAD is that these EAD extensions are taking a long time. They don't yet have premium processing available to it. So if you are on EAD, whether it's H4 EAD or your green card EAD, make sure that you apply for your extension at least six months before your expiry date, because that will give you one full year of remaining on EAD. The fact that you have applied for your extension will qualify you for 180 days of automatic extension of EAD. So even after your card expires, as long as you have applied for your extension before it expires, you will qualify for 180 days extension. So that way you don't have to lose your job. That is a very important clarification that I wanted to make. And the, another one is if you are planning to use advanced payroll to go outside the United States, check the validity of your AP card. It has to be valid on the day you come back because if it doesn't, you will be stuck in India either to get a re-entry permit or get your H-1B stamp again. And that is a big hassle. So make sure that when you are, whenever you are traveling on EAD, your card is valid until the time you come back. If you want to get in touch with me for your specific situation, do contact me on my Calendly because I can set up 30 minutes with you and we can talk over your issue. Again, that will be my personal opinion and not a legal advice, but I will be able to share you my experience. So I know for sure that some of you are interested in stock trading, day trading, buying cryptocurrencies. I want to present you Webull. Webull is a trading platform. It allows you to buy stock. It allows you to buy options, do options trading. It also it allows you to buy cryptocurrency. It can be done on the computer or on the mobile app. Now, if you use my link, which is on the screen and also in the description, you will get some free stocks. Webull has announced that it will give 12 free stocks if you use my link and those free stocks will be valued up to maximum of $30,600. So when you open an account using my link, you will get two free fractional share stocks. That value could be anywhere between $3 to $300. If you deposit at least one penny, you will get four to 10 free additional stocks valued from $7 to $3,000. So that's 12 stocks from Webull free for you if you use my link and enjoy your free stocks. If you like the content of this video, do hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel and I'll see you in the next one.